This episode of the Creative Nonfiction Podcast is brought to you by the word plot it. An enthusiastic expression of approval. Head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a plot it for the podcast. Hey, CNF, it's CNF Pod. Creative Nonfiction Podcast is a show where I speak to badass people about telling true stories, usually. I'm Brendan O'Mara. How's it going? Today's guest is no guest because the podcast is dead. JK, JK, JK. What with book research and writing somewhat and my inability to read a book in less than two weeks these days, I simply don't have a guest in the hopper. Maybe next week, one can hope. So I have a short essay that I that, uh, that might surprise you about author readings. I fucking hate them. I hate participating in them. I hate attending them. But first, while I have your attention, I will be moving my newsletter from Substack to Beehive, a more traditional newsletter delivery service. I don't trust Substack long term. It's a social network, in case you haven't figured that out already. And you know what happens to social networks. They get corrupted. So I deleted my rage against the algorithm newsletter on that platform. It is solely on Beehive now. So you should... Be heading over to brendanamara.com hey, hey, for show notes, blog posts, and to sign up for the Rage Against the Algorithm newsletter. Always first of the month. No spam. Still can't beat it. And if you dig the show, remember, we'll always take plaudits on Apple Podcasts, so the wayward CNFer might say, shit, I'll give that a shot. And why not? Why not give Athletic Brewing a shout out, my favorite non-alcoholic beer out there? Not a paid plug. I'm a brand ambassador, as some of you know. I want to celebrate this amazing product, and if you head to athleticbrewing.com, use the promo code BRENDANO20 at checkout, you get a nice little discount on your first order. I have a little referral link on my website as well. So you can, uh, so whatever, I get credit for it. Okay, I want credit. I want credit where credit is due. I don't get any money. And they're not an official sponsor of the podcast. I just get points for swag and non-alcoholic beer. Give it a shot. Okay, maybe it's my ADHD, but when it comes to author readings, I can't focus. I can't stay engaged, no matter how hard I try. There are any number of reasons why they suck. Let's dispense with, you know, perhaps my own shortcomings as an audience member, someone with a pathological inability to not drift off or fall asleep while in an audience. Drifting off is the big one. Falling asleep, close second, but it's usually... My mind starts going somewhere else, but in my defense, few writers are skilled in reading. You're a writer. You work in the quiet hours. You prefer quiet. And now you're being asked to turn it on? Whose idea was this anyway? Fuck that guy. But okay, set aside how bad readings are for the moment. You must attend them because, okay, here's the cynicism. You want people to attend yours. And you're not an asshole, are you? We work hard not to be assholes in this biz. Well, some of us do, others don't. First, the author is standing at a lectern by themselves, usually reading to an audience, if you're lucky. And this strikes me way too much like you're being lectured, like you're in school being talked at. It's not participatory, and by and large, it's very boring. Honestly, I want to read the book in the voice that emerges in my own head. Your voice ruins that for me, you see. You took something from me, you asshole. I reached out to Allison K. Williams, not an asshole, author of Seven Drafts, self-edit like a pro from blank page to book. She's been on the show a couple times, no bigs, and a, a great blog post for brevity, The Seven Deadly Sins of Public Readings, link in show notes. An excellent reader and surprise, a performer, and she has some tips from authors. Here's, here's a real simple, simple one. Real simple one, she said. And, and I quote, Try not to read from your laptop. On most podiums, the lid blocks your upper body. And it's an old theater trick that when the audience can see your chest, they feel more emotionally connected to you. End quote. And okay, now all the perverts in the room get out. You know what Allison means. The full frontal squares to the crowd and it's vulnerable. This isn't about text. This is something more. Second, a reading is a performance. And I italicize that word. Couldn't you tell? And so many authors I've seen read from their work, they read it like it's in a, a, a eulogy. And, and sure, some pieces are somber and you want to reflect that tone, maybe. But you still need to have some ups and downs. 
and swirls in your vocal cadence. Again, Allison, uh, she asks you to put some fervor into your voice, like you're reading something powerful. She says, acting like it's important makes it sound important, and it's not showmanship for showmanship's sake. It has to have purpose. But also, don't bore me. And I've been to enough of these readings where I assume you're going to bore me, so you've already got a pretty high bar to clear before the proprietor reads a list of your accomplishments she printed out from your website's about page. I know what I'm talking about. The last reading I enjoyed, frankly, it might be the last one I attended. Uh, and this has nothing to do with COVID. Even if there was no COVID, I probably likely would not have attended any any readings. It was at AWP in Portland, Oregon. And there was Hanifa Duraki and Elena Passarello. They read from their work. And it was electric. You know, why? Well, Elena's voice is strong and she captivates the audience with her energy. There's no laptop in front of her. She looked like... She was going to pop out of her own skin, and for a moment, she might have. Elena's a friend, but I'm not biased. I looked around the room, and they were howling like wolves. Hanif, likewise, is more subdued, but the instrumentality of his voice is singular. It lands on the air in a way that makes you lean in, so you can fully take in his message. And sure, as writers, we should read our work aloud to ourselves in the privacy of our own home office. But honestly, these words are meant to be read rather than spoken, and sometimes the prose doesn't lend itself to the vocal performance. You want to de-syllabize or de-syllabize whatever your words. I'm talking about taking some syllables away. You want to refrain from saying made-up words like de-syllabize at the lectern without your laptop in front of you. Frankly, not every author is comfortable reading in front of a group of people, so why force it? Why do you suppose that certain audiobooks and certainly certain essays on this American life are often read by actors? Unless you're okay, this guy's voice, this guy's last name, I can have to say it really slow. Okay, unless you're Mike Berbiglia or David Sedaris, Ira Glass will likely hire an actor. They're performers, and they make their voices the vector, man. You've laid out a bunch of problems, B.O., and I'm wondering, what are you going to do about it? Are you just going to sit there in your little studio speaking into your Heil PR40 and not tell me how to do better? Maybe you're the asshole and you wouldn't be wrong, man. Okay, so you're promoting a book and you must do events. And maybe you have the backing of a publisher who is setting up an event or several or uh, maybe you sprung for a good publicist, and now you're in every major city and you got to make the round. Your name is up on the marquee at Powell's and you're starting to panic. This might be a matter of taste, but my favorite events are when authors don't read from their work at all. I like a cool presentation, maybe with some cool visuals. Go to an Austin Cleon reading and this is what you get. His are fun and engaging. I don't fall asleep. That's how I know they're engaging. Plenty of Q&A is great. Assuming the audience doesn't get bashful and doesn't ask, and just doesn't ask anything. And then then they look around the room like, I hope someone has a question, but it sure as fuck isn't going to be me. And then one brave soul does it. That leads to two. And and now now we're getting our time's worth here, and if not our money's worth, because I hope you bought the book. Why else are you there? I suppose this can be circumvented by passing around an index card for people who would rather have their question read and not have to speak it and perform it in front of a crowd and feel judged like you're in the pool at a press conference. Been there. Hate that. Also, few people know how to ask a question and get out of the way. There's a tendency among even professional interviewers to answer the question for the guest in an effort not to sound stupid. Don't over-explain the question. Ask the question, get out. Have you noticed that I'm unafraid to sound stupid? That might be a product of killing too many brain cells with 7% ABV IPAs. Hmm, Maybe. You wouldn't be wrong. Anything that gets the audience involved is a bonus. Anything that makes them think that you, the author, are a charming personality and that they genuinely feel like they could have an espresso with you or a sunflower butter-based ice cream cone. Personality and relatability will sell books better than reading from the work. You know, I guess what's in vogue these days are the in-conversation-with 
conversations and you see the author put their little headshot in one corner of the Instagram thing and then the other person who recently had a book out also puts their headshot in the other corner. And it basically, it makes for a, an, an in real life podcast. And these can be tricky because there's no edit button. And if the interviewer is not careful, it can sound like a bro sesh that everyone else is lucky to be part of. Can you hear the scare quotes I put around lucky without saying quote unquote? That's called wit, man. Sidebar, the first 20 minutes of most dude hosted podcasts can and likely should be edited out. You know who you are. Another thing. So, okay, probably can't 100% avoid reading. It's kind of baked into it, whatever. So maybe it'd be a good investment to hire a vocal coach or even better, an acting coach. Your book is a script, in a sense. You're the actor at the table reading, only you have to read the entire script and be all the characters and the voiceover and the scene setter. So please, inflect, make a little eye contact, command the room. This isn't to say you should be something you're not, but I've seen people who are lovely conversationalists who get up to the lectern and suddenly drone. They're like a sad sunflower, all droopy and hunched over, petals falling all out. Falling out. Uh, the beauty is there, it just needs help. George Saunders is a great reader, Neil Gaiman... Gaiman? Game? Gaiman? I'm going to say Gaiman. Neil Gaiman. Susan Orlean, Isabel Wilkerson, the late Philip Gerard. They are arresting vocalists and performers of their work. I had a conversation with a poet at a reading who categorically hates poet voice. You've heard poet voice before. Don't lie. The voice that floats like a soap bubble on the wind Eyes cast somewhere to the back of the room, speaking to you as you might a child at bedtime. And hey, teach their own. If that's your gin, then you do you. Attend readings with, uh, of this nature and soak it up. I'm not being critical of these people or making fun, though it sounds like I am. I I'm pointing out my taste and reasons as to why I think readings are dull. Again, as writers, we're not trained performers. And a reading is, make no mistake, a performance. Also, if you're going to read, keep to like 10 minutes tops. Ideally five. I think five's good. Leave the audience wanting more. Leave the audience wanting. I should say I'm a shitty reader. During readings of my first book, before this podcast broke the internet, I was uh, a dull reader, you might say. Probably read too fast. Probably read too long. At least I think I was. But no, I was definitely, that was definitely bad. I, I read at a horse show in the middle of the woods in Old Forge, New York, between events. I've read at MFA programs. I've read at historical societies to four people sitting across the table from me. I've read at bookstores and breweries. And let me tell you something. And let me issue a formal apology to everyone. I always left room for plenty of Q&A, but I will henceforth leave more. And if I ever finish this book I'm working on now and don't have my contract nulled, and voided, and I have to pay back my advance. Still a huge possibility, don't tell my wife. I will refrain from reading if I can. Maybe I'll turn my readings, if you want to call them that, into a talk called So You Want to Write a Biography, or So You've Ruined Your Life. This concludes the presentation. Any questions? Stay wild, CNFers, and if you can do, interview. See ya. See ya.